Here's a book I came across called uh, Trans Antiquity. Cross-dressing and transgender dynamics in the ancient world. <laughs> so actually, this is written by uh, experts on the uh, ancient world, PhDs and whatnot. So chapter one is titled Between the Human and the Divine, Cross-Dressing and Transgender Dynamics in the Greco-Roman World. So we're going back, you know, a couple thousand years here. All right, so here's one passage. Uh, On Cyprus, both males and females cross-dressed during particular rites for an androgynous divinity assimilated with Aphrodite. According to Plutarch's Life of Theseus, a rite existed in which men even simulated birth pangs, referring to ritual cross-dressing, as shown by Miller, who distinguishes maybe a bit too strictly between religious rites in which transvesticism is mandatory, licensed, or or tolerated. In Rome, cross-dressing is practiced in the Saturnalia, and of course, Saturn, another one of their gods. The priests have turned into women. This gender reassignment is allowed, achieved, and guaranteed through the intervention of the goddess herself. And this is the difference between the normal male eunuch and the female eunuch priest. This form of self-representation is not only literary, since an inscription from Cyzicus represents a priest in female dress celebrating rites in honor of the great mother of the gods. A eunuch priest did not receive an inheritance because legally he could not be considered either a man or a woman. Uh Uh-huh. These are two points at stake here. The role of the divine sphere as author and guarantor of the gender change, and at the same time, the necessity that this change be recognized and accepted by the public. Now, this is interesting, okay? That's what's going on now, okay? So these people have this religion that continues today in the elite that uh, androgyny brings about divine transformation, and uh, they actually uh, become godlike in in their mind, and they uh, communicate with the gods, the small g gods, who they uh, they worship as as divine beings. And androgyny is kind of their, their gateway, their portal to connect with these gods. And um, they, they've been doing this in secret, although it's been hidden in plain sight. If you just look closely, you can tell that they're all a bunch of androgynes. But they realize that the public will not accept them as they truly are. You know, for example, um, all the uh, the first ladies of the United States, they've all been men, okay? pretending to be women. Now, the public will not accept that. It would freak people out. So it says here, at the same time, the necessity that this change, this divine change of gender, of sex, into the divine androgyne, it needs to be recognized and accepted by the public. See, that they've never really had that, maybe to a certain degree, a small percentage of the public. And nowadays, what we see is this major propaganda. Look at any form of mass media, anywhere at any time, and you're going to see the transgender agenda. Sometimes it's subtle, sometimes it's overt, sometimes it's covert. But mass media was basically created, as well as, you know, things like the United Nations was created to bring about this public acceptance of androgyny. And in fact, it's going to be forced (laughs) on us, and it is being forced, and it's being forced on children. All right, think about vaccines. All right, vaccines are forced on children, right? And they say, well, it's to, uh, you know, cure disease, prevent disease, whatnot. Instead of vaccines to prevent some kind of disease, children will be given hormones of the opposite sex and or puberty blockers to prevent them from being one sex or the other. Become eunuchs and attend to female chores, live as women, and are called in the same way. The Greeks suggest that they are considered to have been rendered so by the gods. Transition is therefore only possible for divine beings who can change the gender of animals and humans, the eunuch priests, Addis, as well as their own. In most cases, the gods are androgynous in the sense of a choice of one sex or the other and not the simultaneous possession of both. Dionysus, as a god, can cross this boundary. So you do see these uh, gods in ancient literature changing their sex on and off. Sometimes they appear as a man, sometimes as a woman, sometimes as, as both or a mixture. Once 
Pentheus is in women's clothes, he is convinced he has acquired supernatural powers. This is again connected to the divine properties associated with crossing the gender boundaries. Okay, superpowers, all right? Androgyny gives people superpowers. That's what they believe, and that's what they practiced. Dionysus is a god particularly linked to a wealth of similar episodes. In a fragment from the Edonians, Lycurgus addresses him as man-woman. Mythology testifies to many examples, starting from Zeus developing a male uterus in the thigh for Dionysus after Samil's death. Jupiter transitions into a female to assume the figure of Diana in order to seduce the nymph Callisto. Now, Diana is a Wonder Woman, Diana Prince, Inanna, Ishtar, Isis, Aphrodite. And keep in mind that Freemasonry and alchemy and Kabbalah basically believe these same things as well. Some gender reassignment cases can be found in Ovid's Metamorphosis, and they all appear to have been carried out by divine figures. Sanius asks Neptune to let her become a man, and this wish is granted. After the transition, however, his enemies make fun of him, since they do not understand the power of the god. In addition, Iphis transitions from female to male after many prayers, thanks to direct intervention by Isis. Antonius presents us with transgender myths, which all show divine intervention in allowing transition. Theresius's transition was brought about by Athena. Gender reassignment is possible, therefore, only through divine intervention, which by definition transcends the rules of the natural. Okay, now this section here. The king is not naked, but he wears women's clothes. <laughs> Hellenistic kings and Roman emperors appear on different occasions to have performed transgender acts. All right, great kings and Roman emperors. According to the perspective outlined above, these performances had the function of claiming for themselves a divine nature or a particular connection with the divine sphere. Okay, so that's why Freemasons always cross-dress, and at the very least, they have uh, transgendered wives, right? And many of them may be FTMs as well. The first known example is Alexander the Great. Ephipus wrote that the king often dressed up as a divinity, in particular to perform the roles of Ammon, Hermes, Heracles, and Artemis. After him, the Hellenistic world is full of examples of kings performing in drag as goddesses. Ptolemy, Lagos appearing on coins as Athena, Demetrius presenting himself as Athena and as Apollo, and Ptolemy IV portrayed as Aphrodite. Cleopatra VII, sometimes represented with masculine traits or directly as a man. Julius Caesar, whose adoption of typical forms of Hellenistic kingship in self-representation should not be doubted. It is well known that Caesar was often defined with female names, according to Curio. He was a man for all women and a woman for all men. While this was a very common occurrence for important politicians, it is not unusual for Caesar to show no trace of being bothered by such jokes. On the contrary, when called a woman by a senator, he compared himself to Semiramis and the Amazons. Again, Wonder Woman, ambassador for the United Nations. Okay, a transgendered goddess. Such jokes could have implied in the frame of Hellenistic kingship that he had the ability to change gender. Sex is probably the better word there, by the way. But uh, this must be interpreted next to Caesar's ambition to change nature and thus as a descendant of Venus. Caligula, frequently cross-dressed, developed into gender transition and divine identification. Caligula indeed performed as Venus, as well as other deities, following Alexander's model. Caligula thought he should be considered above the rest of mankind, but also that in this way he was impersonating many gods and goddesses, such as Jupiter, Neptune, Hercules, Bacchus, Apollo, Juno, Minerva, and Venus. The emperor, aware of Alexander's precedent, was thus claiming a divine nature, not only by dressing up as different gods and goddesses, but also through his transgender performance. A public ready to recognize his legitimacy in doing this would have to recognize his divinity. This legitimacy was not recognized on account of senatorial opposition, presumably, 
and definitely not by Suetonius, who, as mentioned, presents this alongside simple discursive offensive and depicts the entire performance as ridiculous. So again, they believe they're gods, but the people don't always accept them as gods. (laughs) Nero was apparently married twice to men, (laughs) once to Pythagoras. These guys are a bunch of alchemists, right? Kabbalists. Babylonian mysticism, okay, fused into uh, Greek philosophy. Commodus, who claimed divine nature also by performing as Hercules Romanus, would appear in the arena dressed as an Amazon. And indeed, he also assumed the name Amazonius for his official titulature. In other performances, he played Hercules dressed in female clothes, or more simply, cross-dressed in full public view. Elagabalus unsuccessfully trying to construct legitimacy for the cult of Baal, in which he was priest, performed frequently as a woman, and wanted to be called Bassiana. The ancient mentality considered a transgender performance as a possible form of imperial self-representation as a divine figure. The emperor could change his own gender or that of other people, Gallienus is presented in a transgender way, and therefore as a divine figure. This one right here, it's got the beard, but he's got these feminine uh, symbols. Gallienus was placing himself astride a shifting boundary that was seen as fluid and not necessarily determined the better to embody his being in contact with the supernatural force that had helped bring victory and peace to the endangered East. Gallienus does not represent the goddess on the coins, but himself as the goddess. Contact with the supernatural force is once again the claim to a divine nature, which allows the complete control of gender and sex, and therefore enables a transgender self-representation, even directly in divine forms, as had already happened with Alexander the Great and Caligula. In the end, gender transition was possible in the classical world and was possible in the sphere of performance. What enabled such performances to be made public and accorded certain individuals with legitimacy to cross boundaries was a divine nature or a deep close contact with the divine sphere. Transitioning is possible for deities or is enacted by deities Transgender enactment in the classical world was thus a way of claiming superhuman powers and capacities in the public domain. But whenever the public at whom the performance was aimed did not recognize such superhuman qualities, the transition would fail and the boundary crosser would appear as a rather ridiculous figure, falling back into the derogatory transgender discourse. Contrary to our modern Western perspective, therefore, over the sphere of the conventional and normative human, there was a space for the superhuman, transgender sphere of the divine. All right, so that's what's going on. That's what the world leaders are doing. It's the same thing they were doing back then. They just have better surgeons now, more advanced makeup, and we have this uh, mass media technology that can deliver their images and their influence all over the world. They want to transcend the material world and become a divine androgyne. 